Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Eric Rauschway, professor of history at the University of California at Davis and the author of The Great Depression and the New Deal, a very short introduction. Eric, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks very much for having me. And I want to tell our listeners that uh, I, I suspect this will be the first of a number of podcasts that we will do on the Great Depression. As uh, Eric mentioned, as we were preparing for this interview, unfortunately, uh, we're at a time in American history today where there's interest in the Great Depression because I think people are correctly worried about the state of the economy. So to start our conversation, Eric, I'd like to go back to the 1920s, as you do in your book, which is uh, very nicely written. And, a, a, you know, it is a uh, it is a very short introduction, but you manage to cover a great deal. And you spend a reasonably a large amount of time on the run-up to the Depression, which I found very uh very interesting. Talk about what was happening in America in the 1920s in the economy. Sure. I think it's uh, impossible to understand the New Deal without first understanding the Great Depression. And I think it's impossible to understand the Great Depression unless you go back at least to, let's say, 1919. So if you spot me one year on the 20s, that would be helpful. I think uh, you need to understand that uh, both in the world and in America, there's a new system of debt that's created after World War I. So in the book, and I think in, in our discussion, it would be helpful to, to, to talk about both of those uh, areas. You can refer to the pre-World War I period as well, which is also relevant. How and interesting. Can I go? <laughs> uh, you can go back to the Garden of Eden, Donna yeah, Mann, yeah. uh, Pint- you know, uh, Austro, you know, Pythagoras, whatever is useful to you. Go ahead. Well, I mean, I think it's, it's if you think of the okay. First of all, let me let me let me acknowledge my debt, my own debt here, which is that I'm sort of channeling John Maynard Keynes' assessment of the world at around 1919 from his uh, sometimes uh, quite fierce polemic on the subject of the Treaty of Versailles. And Keynes says of the world before the war that it was an economic utopia because although we do know that there were tariffs and so forth and so on, really goods, uh, capital investment, and people moved fairly freely around this world. And Keynes says, look, it's the first time in history we've seen the Malthusian you know, sort of fetters on civilization's growth be lifted because we can export labor to the new world, uh, we can export uh, manufactured goods in the new world, you can import cheap foodstuffs from the new world, and uh, life is wonderful. And the war, of course, puts paid to all that. Uh, And Keynes, in identifying the flaws in the Versailles Treaty, not only talks uh, famously or maybe perhaps infamously about the reparations, which are a whole separate subject, I think, but also about what's not in the treaty. And he says what's not in the treaty is any attempt to reconstruct Europe, and I'm paraphrasing here, or to readjust the systems of the old world and the new. Uh, And one of the results, Keynes says, of this this lousy treaty with its many omissions are going to be a depression in which men in their desperation will overthrow civilization, which turns out to be a pretty good prediction. I should mention that we have... uh an online copy of The Economic Consequences of the Peace by Keynes, and we'll put a link to it up uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on this uh, podcast. So carry That's on. That's good, because Keynes' prose is better than my summary of it. But uh, um, so One way to understand this, I think, in, in the historical, long historical perspective, you know, when Keynes says what's not in the treaty and what its bad results might be, uh, we can think to ourselves, well, what would have happened had there been um, – a Bretton Woods settlement and a Marshall Plan after World War I are the equivalent. You know, would we have been able to avoid the Great Depression and thereby possibly World War II and a lot of other unpleasant stuff? I mean, if you take Keynes' argument sort of on its merits, the answer the answer might be yes. I don't know if anyone's actually run the numbers on the plausibility of that, and the political plausibility of it is nil. But it's, it's one way of thinking about what might have been necessary to set the world back on the rails after the catastrophe of World War One. Let's talk about the integration, what we now call globalization, that was missing at the time in that, post, uh, in that post-World War I world or that Keynes was worried about. Certainly, as you point out, the political possibilities were nil. There were too many dead 
Frenchmen and too many dead Englishmen to generate enough sympathy for Germany to create a Marshall Plan uh, in post World War One. But w- what happened to um, to capital flows and borrowing in the twenties that was important uh, for for this story? Well, World War One is a watershed in the history of international capital flows. Uh, as, 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 as limited as the sources are on this, we can say that with some fair degree of certainty. You know, before World War One, the United States is the world's great borrower. After World War One, the United States is the world's great creditor. So there's this almost overnight switch in who's at the center of the world's uh, lending and borrowing network. And now it's the U.S. And before the war, it was the U.K. Uh, and the system in before the war of international borrowing had evolved more or less by chance, but by the time you had the run-up to the war, particularly the British commentators had come to see it as a great virtue that you know money was lent to push out the frontiers of new nations. This money was used to build railroads, to extend uh, ranching, to you know fence in commons and turn it over to agriculture, and so that money was therefore returned with interest, and uh, the, the borrowers uh, could develop these countries and then buy British goods, and it was a sort of virtuous circle. Uh, by contrast, of course, what happened in uh, World War One was that there was a great deal of borrowing, and it was all literally destructive, uh, with the belligerents borrowing money to, you know, literally blow each other up. So they didn't have very much to show for their borrowing after World War One. Everybody owed everybody else money. On top of that, there were, of course, reparations assessed on Germany. And then uh, in, in the net, most of the money was owed eventually to the United States. So everybody needed to pay a great deal of money to the United States in the 1920s and this... had very little wherewithal to do it uh, in as much as they'd seen so many of their young and most productive workers killed and uh, so many of their fields sort of run over by infantry and factories destroyed and so forth. So you were in a very um, different and disadvantageous uh, situation in terms of global debt in the 1920s as compared with before the war. And how did the 20s then proceed? Right. How did the 20s then proceed? Not, not well. Yeah. I mean, on balance. A few good years in there. Sorry? Uh, there were a few good years in there for America. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's Not so much the for the Weimar Republic, but... <laughs> it turns out nicely, you know, in the short run for the United States, uh, which is perhaps not surprising. It's the, only, it's the country least touched by the war. Uh, and with new tariffs raised after the war, with new barriers to immigration raised after the war in the United States... There's uh, very little foreign competition uh, for legal as well as substantial reasons. So you have this kind of world system where nobody can sell to the United States. Nobody can, and I use nobody in a sort of elusive sense. Obviously, some people can sell to the United States. Some people can go to the United States. But broadly speaking, very few people can sell to the United States and can go to the United States. So there's not a lot of way to relieve the pressure on uh, European economies. Um, and countries around the rest of the world rely on continued American lending you know, to, to keep being able to pay off their debts and to try to reinvest and to rebuild their economies. Meanwhile, as you say, in the United States, um, great times, or apparently great times. And it, this is the other half of the story about debt that I think you have to tell in the 1920s, which is much as the world situation, system of debt uh, flipped in World War I, Americans' attitudes about debt flipped in the same years, and you had a doubling of household debt uh, after World War I. And uh, Americans were much more willing to buy much more on credit over the decade of the 1920s than they ever had before. This is when you see GMAC set up shop. It's when you see the General Motors Corporation begin to sell cars because they're new this season, not because you, you need a new car. And so you have uh, the beginnings of our modern consumer culture, where people are buying things because they want them and not because they have the money, but because they can get the credit, uh, which for to a get while the, looks wonderful. But to get to the credit, you know, it's an interesting parallel to the, <clears throat> the last decade, obviously, that we're living in right now. And I think it's, uh, you know, obviously we can, we can make too much of that or maybe too little. I hope not, but I hope too much. But, you know, in – in the last part of the 1990s, as the stock market was doing extremely well, uh, people decided they wanted to consume some of that paper wealth, those, the wealth they'd gained on paper, and they did go into more debt. But um, they were trying to smooth their consumption. They, 
They weren't necessarily being irresponsible in and of the, in and of itself. Borrowing is not irresponsible. It's borrowing that you can't pay back. And of course, lenders want to get their money back. So I'm sure GMAC extended those loans, hoping, expecting that people could pay them back. And I, I again, not I'm not an expert on the 20s, but I do su- suspect that the stock market run-up of that time was probably what gave people the confidence that they could meet their debt obligations and would be repaid. Uh, yeah, I'm not trying to levy any moral judgments. I'm only trying to describe what happened, right? I mean, you know, uh, there was a massive increase of debt. I mean, you can then say, well, and maybe that would have been fine in the long run uh, had certain other things not also occurred, right? I agree. Uh, yeah, and the same goes for the foreign debt, for that matter. I mean, you can say this system whereby you had tariff barriers and immigration barriers and other countries dependent on U.S. borrowing, you know, that, that might have been fine. And with the Dawes settlement, it looked like, you know, in the long run, it could have been fine. But you don't, you don't always get the long run, right, to solve these problems, you know, since <laughs> uh, intervening. Yeah, correct. So, right. Well, what I liked about the book is it reminded me, uh, you know, I was aware of the, the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, uh, but I didn't think about the limitations on people crossing borders, um, and so the, the impact, as you point, as you just mentioned, on restraining immigration was another factor in um, the closing off of the country. Yeah, uh, interestingly, this is not one that features in sort of modern economic history. There's plenty of modern economic history done about uh, capital movements and uh, on tariff barriers. Um, you had to, I had to go back to kind of Brindley Thomas, some real old classics there, to dig out some of the stuff on immigration. And maybe that's because it doesn't have the effect that one would think. But there was a common sense perception at the time that it was that immigration restriction was placing strain on uh, European economies, at least relative to their position before World War One. And similarly, on the, on the tariff side, uh, you point out again, which is something I was not aware of, there were increases in tariffs in America, I think, maybe elsewhere in, in the early part of the 20s. Right. I mean, the the United States has a uh, recession or downturn or depression or whatever you want to call it shortly after World War One, and this is right after the Republicans sweep back into uh, Washington, having you know during the sort of the Wilson uh, interregnum there. Backlash against his yeah, against uh, the, I mean, it's a huge, huge uh, vote victory for Harding at the polls and for normalcy and all that stuff. And it's backlash against you know everything as you as you suggest internationalism, the sort of the, all the kinds of crusading that have gone under the rubric of progressivism, all that sort of thing. And, and indeed, in, in a reaction probably too against the uh, severities of the Red Scare and anti-radicalism of mm-hmm. 19, 19, 19, 20. So it was this huge sort of just let's go back to normal. And part of going back to normal was restoring uh, some old standbys of Republican economic policy. I mean, under the Democrats, uh, you'd seen tariffs lowered and an income tax raised. So when the Republicans come in, the, the, the income taxes go down and the tariffs come back up. And this is justified in part as an emergency reaction to the economic downturn. You know, let's have an emergency tariff act, and there's also an emergency immigration act. But yeah, they, these come in in 1921, and then they're made more permanent, and the schedule of tariffs is extended in 1922 with the Fort New McCumber Act. And then, as you say, the Holly Smoot Act is sort of the most notorious. Uh, I Which think, is 1930. Yeah. And is greeted and again, by... And treated as sort of as an emergency kind of thing by the time it's actually passed. And greeted by the rest of the world with their own tariffs in response. Yeah. Sorry, excuse right? me. Yes. I mean, tariffs are rising around the world throughout the 20s, and the, one of the things the League of Nations tries to do and is unsuccessful at doing, as in many of its endeavors, unfortunately, is to try to get agreement to keep tariffs down, but there's no dice. And the first really chilling event then of the 20s, which is, so it's got these political bumps, but, um, you know, a recession in the early part, but nothing really uh, severe until uh, we get the crash in 29. Right. Well, so then you have the crash. Uh, There's there are arguments that the crash is precipitated by the Federal Reserve's deliberate efforts to curb speculation. I personally have no reason to disbelieve these arguments, but that, that, that I will say that there, there are arguments about this. Uh, the Federal Reserve Board decides to curb speculation. It doesn't like the idea that bank money is being used to buy uh, these investments on Wall Street, which they see as um, you know sort of not as lacking in substantial value, and so they raise interest rates. And they do this uh, actually first in, in 28, uh, which was one of the things that um, 
messes up the international system. This is when you raise rates in the U.S., all of a sudden uh, it becomes more attractive to invest in the U.S. than overseas. Uh, capital export falls, and countries that depend on money coming out of the United States uh, begin to suffer already, even before the crash. Uh, Germany, particularly. Then, yes, you get the uh, the bursting of the stock market, well, uh, the stock market bubble uh, in uh, October of 1929. And that's followed by um, some bank problems. Right. Well, there's this terrific uh, or horrific drop in uh, consumer spending almost immediately after the stock market crash. And just as you were saying before, uh, much as the borrowing of the 20s uh, seems to have depended on a perception that, you know, times were getting better and the stock market was kind of an index of that. Similarly, you know, the sudden cutting off of consumer uh, borrowing and buying immediately after the crash is a reaction to the stock market's failure. So once, of course, you have this immediate drop in consumer spending, and you can see this, you know, in the drop of new automobile registrations and so forth, and it extends right through 1930, then, then you have an immediate transfer via this uh, uncertainty mechanism to what we, we call the real economy right now. And again, just looking at the parallels, we just last month, a 30% drop in automobile purchases, a real cheerful uh, uh, parallel. But um, Yeah, I mean, that was the really the alarming thing for me was the consumer drop-off figures yeah. in the last few weeks. Well, yeah. People are afraid they're going to lose their job. Um, and um, I think uh, lenders are afraid people are going to lose their jobs. So, I, you know, just to comment on the current situation for a moment, I find it strange that Secretary Paulson is uh, angry that the banks are not lending the money he's giving them for that purpose. Well, banks are interested in profits. They're not social agencies. Um, if he wanted them to be, he could nationalize them explicitly. But uh, if you don't think you have something good to invest in, you're not going to invest. And if people don't want to borrow, they're not going to borrow. If they're worried, they're not going to be able to pay it back. At least sometimes that happens. Um, I, think that, I think, sorry, if I could come yeah, in on that. I mean, I think that's right, and I think there's a nice parallel with the 30s. It's really quite explicit. I mean, the Hoover administration creates something called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation or with Congress in January of 32. And its job is to do basically what the TARP starts out doing, uh, you know, a few months ago, which is uh, the RFC is originally going to lend money based on banks' distressed assets rather than actually buy the distressed assets, but lend money to banks to prop them up. And they realize by the summer of 32 that this isn't going to work, that they really need to recapitalize the banks. Uh, yeah, this should sound familiar to you. Yeah. <laughs> it actually takes till Roosevelt comes into office for that to go through because Hoover doesn't like the idea of buying bank stock. That's look like socialism to him. So we actually went in the last, you know, whatever it's been now, six to ten weeks, through uh, very swiftly the same policy-making process that it took from January 32 to March 33 to go through back then. So that's slightly encouraging. Yeah, we sped it up. Of course, the speed of it, uh, I think, uh, discomforts um, investors and uh, consumers. Uh, They don't have a chance to catch their breath, and they start wondering what next change will be tomorrow. Well, but and when you can expect change to happen. I mean, one is, as you say, right now, banks are feeling rather cautious. I mean, again, to draw the parallel to the 30s, when they did start buying bank stock, uh, the RFC had Jesse, um, Jesse Jones got quite frustrated that the banks weren't lending. And the RFC actually said, well, fine, we'll lend. And lo and behold, they found that it wasn't because the banks were timid. It was because there weren't enough qualified borrowers, as you've just been suggesting about the current situation. So, I mean, that, that, that's, it takes a very long time in the 30s to go through that process of experimentation realization. We seem to be going through it much quicker, yeah, could, which I hope in the end will mean that we'll recover much yeah, quicker, that, too. That could be a good sign. It could yeah. be. I, I think the, the uncertainty about what's going to happen next is, is, is offsetting it, possibly, but I guess we'll, we'll find out. Yeah. But let's go back to Hoover. So Hoover... Um, he signs this, the Tariff Act, and he, I think he does it with some zeal. He thinks it's going to help. Um, but he does, contrary to the sort of, um, I think, myth that he was a laissez-faire ideologue, he, he wasn't a socialist. You're right. He wasn't comfortable with policies that, that smacked of, of government nationalization. But he, he was not a stand idly by guy either. He did do some things. Uh, desperately, because he was going to lose the election, in which he did. So well, tell he us became, what he did. He became increasingly desperate through 1932, it's true. Um, 
I think it's absolutely right to say that Hoover was not a laissez-faire guy. That's not the same as saying he's a proto-New Dealer. I think that's really important to sort of say. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> there, there, there's a lot of gray area to cover I agree. Um, in there. Hoover starts, and also, you know, you have to be realistic when you're assessing Hoover's performance. And, you know, when the stock market crashes, you know, the stock market has crashed before. There have been downturns before. Right. It's 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 not fair to expect of Hoover, you know, on the next day uh, in October 29, or maybe even the next month, uh, the next month after that in December, to suddenly be trying to gin up a New Deal style program. But at some point, you have to say Hoover should have been doing more. So his initial reaction, of course, is to say. Uh, well, this is a downturn. Like many downturns, we're going to get out of it by an increase of consumer confidence. Everybody hang in. Uh, you know, the state of our economy is strong, that sort of thing. A lot of sort of rah-rah stuff. Um, he also tries to coordinate uh, businessmen to prevent a drop in wages on the idea that you want to keep people buying. Um, this is probably, this is first of all probably ineffective because yeah. he can't get enough businessmen to come to his conference so that the entire employers of the country right. could agree. Mm-hmm. Second of all, uh, you know, they get immediately get around it by simply laying people off. So they're paying the same wages, but they're hiring fewer people. So you're not actually keeping the stream of money going out into the economy uh, the same. And of course, it might have been ill-advised, even if it had been effective, because you would have been keeping wages high at a time when maybe you'd want to a measure of readjustment. So that, that, that wasn't a terrific uh, we, we should mention that in 33, uh, unemployment was about 25%. Yeah. What was it in 32? I want to say it was about 15. Was that uh, well, oh, well, I see. The figure for 32 is about 25%, I think. If you, well, I mean, these are annual figures that we have on the historical yeah, record. Was, anyway, suffice it to say, it was pretty horrific at that point. Yeah. We'll put up some data on the site on the precise yeah, numbers. It's, 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 it's a little bit shy of 25% of 32, and it's about at 25% of 33. So it's a very bad time, and normally what would have happened uh, is that wages would fall. As you say, that would have been perhaps the right thing. And, of course, there's this terrible tension, even though there's no Keynesian economics yet because the general theory hasn't been written. Uh, it comes out in 1936. There's this tension between um, what we might call – I think of it still a tension today between, well, right now we have unemployment, so wages have to fall to get employers eager to hire workers again. But if wages fall, there's no purchasing power, and then the economy won't recover. There won't be anything to buy it, people to buy stuff. So this, um, what you might call the circular flow of macroeconomics was a bit um, imperfectly understood and, and certainly not easy politically to navigate. It was imperfectly understood, and then, of course, the real difference between then and now is then you've got no unemployment insurance. You've got no deposit insurance. You've got no uh, old age pensions. I mean, when I say no, I mean, again, you know, there are, there's a little bit here and there. but There's some state-level stuff, and there's some, some private stuff. stuff. There's some private stuff, but one of the signal features of the Depression under Hoover is that by the time you get into 31 and 32, these resources are tapped out, yeah. right? So there really is nothing by a certain point. Uh, the deposit... The state-level deposit insurance schemes have gone under uh, really even from before the crash because of the agricultural difficulties of the 20s, predate the crash. So if people go out of work, the first thing they do is they draw down their savings. Uh, and that puts pressure on the banks. Yep. And uh, the banks are already suffering because, you know, foreign debt is... Uh, you know, not is being going into default, and uh, you know, stock-related uh, debts are going into default. And as these unemployment schemes are drying up, uh, municipalities uh, are going into default, and you know, ultimately states. And so there's a tremendous amount of pressure on the banks, and there's no break on that, and there's no kind of way of softening the blow of of unemployment or of wages falling or anything like that. And as the banks, you know, endure this pressure, uh, and there's no deposit insurance, as soon as it becomes clear that the banks are under pressure, of course, you get runs on banks, and you begin to have banks going under. And uh, so the banking system begins to collapse under Hoover. This is where the stark contrast that's traditionally drawn between Hoover and Roosevelt, uh, I think, really is quite fair. Hoover doesn't do anything 
to stop the bank collapse. And we previously mentioned in connection with the RFC, he's actually loath to do some of the things that people are proposing that he could do, which is it's in, in, in dramatic contrast with what SDR comes does when he comes in in the 33. So this kind of sickening wave of bank collapses over the latter part of Hoover's presidency. And, you know, people's savings just vanish. And there's no recourse. It's pretty and, depressing. Yeah, you, know, you get this lack of confidence in the system, and with no deposit insurance, you know, that just puts further pressure on the system. Because if that bank went under, well, maybe mine will be next. Just a, a side question. Um, one of the interesting pieces of this whole conversation, which sort of hangs over it, is is data. Yeah. And data are a little bit elusive, even when they're carefully measured. Um, and I think you point out that the Great Depression was a great spur to the collection of data, which created the beginnings of our modern um, enterprises of, of data collection at the governmental level, which uh, have been both a boon and a bane, I think, to good economic policy. Mostly a boon, I hope, but uh, it's not a, all rosy. But I'm thinking now about 1894. 1894 was the worst depression, I think, um, before the Great Depression. So it was somewhat fresh in some people's minds, right? It was it was 40 years before. It was closer to them than the Depression. The Great it's, Depression is to us right, now. Right, yeah. by, by a dramatic amount. So there, there were a lot of people alive who had lived through it and remembered it. And it was pretty horrible. We, we don't have good measures, just like we have imperfect measures of, of the Great Depression's economic impact. But there, I... Do you know if, what happened to banks in 1894? I don't. I know a little bit about the relief efforts, which were, of course, not federal. But um, do you know anything about the Depression of 1894? Uh, I don't know numbers on bank failures. I know uh, that there are pressures on banks. Um, but my, my understanding of that is purely anecdotal. I, don't, uh, I know that there's even a great deal of controversy over how bad the unemployment actually is yeah, in, in that era. Uh, but no, I, I don't know. There's a, there's a famous story, you know, about uh, Henry Adams swooping back from Europe to save the family fortune from the Boston banks, which are going mm -hmm. under. But that's that's the kind of anecdotage that I have. I don't really know. Yeah, the only anecdote I have, it's a, a little more cheerful, is uh, yeah. Nathan Strauss uh, single-handedly hands out an extraordinary amount of private relief and, of course, it can't last forever, but it does mitigate some of the personal costs in the city of New York. Uh, I used to be interested in how – I'm still interested. I used to write about the interaction between private and public relief efforts. And, of course, in the right. Great Depression, the federal relief efforts are much more dramatic. There are none in, the, in 1894. They're all city and state and, uh, and private. There's nothing federal going on. But anyway, at any rate, you get, you get the – going back to Hoover, we get these – uh, bank failures, and then uh, then Hoover does little or nothing. Uh, the RFC doesn't work. What else did Hoover try to get things going? Um, but before we get off that, I should say, you know, since you mentioned bank failures uh, and data, you know, the, the um, you can always rely on a good economic historian to try to construct things for you in retrospect. And if you really want, try, yeah. there's quite good stuff on the bank failures uh, by the economist Gary Richardson. So if you want to... Sure. Yeah. I feel like one should always mention one's sources. So, Thank you. Uh, yeah. Put a link up to that. Yeah. Um, he's got some very good stuff on which banks failed and which were temporary failures and which were closures, uh, permanent closures. And stuff. What, what else did Hoover uh, try? What have we got? We've got um, the RSC, which actually came a bit later. We've got uh, the sort of the cheerleading and we've got the businessmen's conference. Um, uh, we've got the tariff. Uh, we have the contraction in the money supply, which you can't really put at his feet. No, I mean, that's the other thing is, the, you know, uh, Hoover's not at fault for that either. The Federal Reserve is Correct. Uh, at fault for that. Um, but they, he does increase spending, yeah. which is, again, I think I was surprised when I went back to the data recently, at least to the extent it's accurate. I, I just didn't think that that was uh, going to be the case, but he does he increases dramatically. And, and, and again, here's another way in which, you know, you have to say that uh, Hoover, whatever his, you know, desires might have been, and they, they, they were somewhat limiting, also he's limited by institutions and circumstances. The federal government is simply not big enough uh, under the, the, the constraints that exist at the time that he's acting to have anything like the kind of effect that, uh, you know, the severity of the Depression is going to allow it to have. 
So yes, he increases spending. Um, they, they, they try to back uh, um, increases of public works by working with the states um, and by getting uh, you know the things that we associate with more with the New Deal online to get people employed and to push money into the economy. Uh, the, the most I think you could say about that is it's too little too late by the time they get around to it. You know, it's not enough stimulus, and um, the things that are, are done are not don't come online until after Hoover uh, is out of office. So he gets um, – we're at about the halfway point of this podcast, which is a good time to switch over okay. to uh, to the New Deal. So Hoover gets – Booted out in November of uh, of 1932, uh, at least he loses the election then. And by the way, uh, Brian Kaplan at EconLog recently uh, uncovered uh, Hoover's last speech before the election where he talks about his economic successes. It's quite an achievement to give such a speech, but he manages, and uh, we'll put a link up to that as well. But uh, he's out, and I don't know whether is – it, is it March or January at that point that he comes this in? Is the last time. Would be inaugurated March fourth, is nineteen thirty three. So this is the last long uh, lame duck period. And so Roosevelt comes in, and uh, what does he do right away? Uh, Roosevelt right away closes the banks. Right, this is the the bank holiday, and uh, this is something that uh, Hoover's advisors had been urging on him, but he was reluctant to do. Um, and uh, Roosevelt comes in, and Roosevelt does it. And they close the banks, and this serves the purposes of purpose of allowing federal officials or people deputed by federal officials to audit the resources of the banks, to certify um, as sound those banks that they think are sound, which is actually it turns out to be the vast majority of them, and to shutter those which are not. And of course, this is, has the salutary effect of restoring effect, uh, restoring confidence in the American banking system. Deposits do, in fact, immediately start coming back into American banks. So this kind of stops the uh, the cascade of bank failures in its tracks. It also sets uh, the country on the road towards uh, federal deposit insurance. Um, shortly after the bank holiday, you have the uh, temporary FDIC created, uh, actually, actually against Roosevelt's uh, judgment or initially, and it's made permanent later. It turns out that, that that was actually probably a good idea, the FDIC. Certainly it's something for which we're thankful today, I think. Remains to be seen. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like the guarantee of Fannie and Freddie. Seems like a good idea at the time. It did generate a lot of um, uh, uh, home mortgages being made that might not otherwise have been made. But uh, hidden cost is often a little more complicated. But uh, yeah, the, it, even even not knowing the future, the record between 1933 and now has been good. Yeah, good point. It's been we've had a good run. Yeah. Uh, I'll grant you that. We, we, yeah. I'll just mention we we recently did a podcast on. Uh, with George Selgin on free banking, and uh, which is a different world. But uh, let, let's go on. So, so Roosevelt closes the banks, reopens them, which gives – by stamping some of them – I assume most of this was psychological – by stamping some of them as fine, others as not fine, it does encourage people to trust the ones that have been stamped as fine. And that's a good thing, and that goes forward. Right. And uh, this, this is also the era in which in the first few weeks of Roosevelt's presidency – you have the United States going off the gold standard, which probably turns out to be a very good thing in the long run as well. And uh, over the course of 1933, uh, Roosevelt walks the dollar in a rather sort of erratic way uh, down to $35 an ounce of gold, where it is pegged uh, at January 1934. And stays um, there for 34 years, I think. Is I that think correct? That's right, right through the Bretton Woods. Or Nixon. Somewhere in maybe well, not uh, not thirty sixty eight seventy seventy one seventy one or so yeah yeah something like that so um, that 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 alone there are some economists I think who will say that those measures alone that we've just summarized might have been adequate right to reverse the downturn uh, and and things would have come. Right, even with that, you would have had a stabilized banking system. You had a devalued dollar. What are the effects of that? Well, now you've attracted deposits, domestic deposits, back into American banks. That's good. Banks have uh, uh, more deposits on hand. Plus, as we've already mentioned, the RFC buys bank stocks, so that increases their capitalization. Plus, uh, you devalue the dollar, which makes the dollar more attractive as a foreign investment, and foreign money begins to come into the United States. Um, there's a tremendous amount of uh, 
uh, overseas money coming into the United States uh, over 1934, and it only increases over the remainder of the decade. Uh, the initial investment in the United States is probably owing to the devaluing of the dollar, but as time goes on, it's more because money is leaving Europe in the Nazi, wake of the Nazi advance or the prospect of the Nazi advance. And the United States seems like a fortunate and now safe place to put that money. So you have a tremendous amount of money coming into the United States, an increase in, as they say, in the high-powered money supply. And the argument is that that, that alone uh, is, is, is enough uh, fuel to the recovery fire. And you, you would, from that alone, have seen uh, a recovery, quite a, quite a good one, in fact. Um, that, that may be true. Hard to know. That, hard to know. That does <laughs> Impossible to know. Not, yeah. uh, sorry? Impossible to know. Impossible but it, to know. It's interesting to speculate about. Fortunately, we don't have a lot of these uh, episodes to compare. So yes. we, we got one, and this is, we make our best generalizations of it. But, but that, of course, even if that were true, and, and it may be, um, that leaves aside the question of what you do with this essentially crippled economy in the meantime so people can actually eat. I the mean, real you, side. Yeah. Right. I mean, you, you say, uh, you mentioned 25% unemployment, and that's a rough measure, let's say, when Roosevelt comes into office. But, you know, that's, that's, that's only the kind of the headline problem. The underlying problem is much deeper. I mean, you know, maybe half of the people who still have jobs only have part of a job because they've gone in for, you know, sort of job sharing to make sure that there's enough jobs to go around. And, of course, you know, any larger number of people depend on them for uh, food, and you know, this is basically a completely crippled economy. And um, you know, r- reports uh, uh, of the era, and there, I don't know if there's a systematic report, but certainly there are municipal reports and anecdotal reports, have lots of people actually going hungry and or starving. So you know, there's another kind of thing where you want to wait for trickle-down monetary policy to take its effect. It, well, that was certainly the uh, the political impetus. So what, what yeah, did... I mean, Comparing the New Deal to now, you know, thank God and, and, and warding off the evil eye and stuff, we are in nothing like the straits that the country was in in 1933, and we should we should be grateful for that. So any reaction uh, to the current crisis, it, you know, we probably shouldn't be acting as if it was 1933 because it's not. Um, 1933 was just an economic debacle, unlike anything else we've seen, except as you say, possibly 1894. Okay, so carry on. So Roosevelt, both on Given the current state of the the state of the economy at the time and the political results that that he had just been put into office to quote do something, right. he proceeds to uh, enact a wide range of stuff. Some of it sticks, some of it doesn't. Some of it he doesn't get past. Some of it's unconstitutional, ruled unconstitutional. So you have a great line in in the book where you say, you know, for this podcast where we talk a lot about Hayek and emergence, you say. The New Deal emerged over time from the fights between the president, the Congress, and the Supreme Court. So give us – It's obviously it's a long list of alphabets, alphabet soup uh, agencies, but give us some um, flavor of the scope of what was tried and, and try to tell us how long it lasted for, what its effect might have been, et cetera. Okay. Well, that, that, that raises two points. I mean, first, the, the thing that you mentioned kindly from the book, I think it's important, and I try to lay out in the book, the extent to which the New Deal is not something that springs from the brain of Franklin Roosevelt. Right? It's something that um, comes out in, in sort of conflict between Roosevelt and Congress and the courts. So you can't sort of say, from this font springs the New Deal. You can't look forward from 33 and say the New Deal is going to look like this. You know, you can only say what the New Deal looks like in retrospect, and it's only because certain experiments have failed, certain things have been found to be politically untenable, and what's left over is what you, you have. And, and, and what's left over is partly shaped by those conflicts, because they, they had to get around the obstacles that they encountered. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, I think, you know, if you want to talk about the New Deal without it becoming a numbing recitation of all these initialisms, you know, the, the PWA, the FERA, and so forth, you have to kind of divide it up into bits. And uh, banking legislation, I suppose, we've basically covered that. Banking legislation generally gets thumbs up, and uh, so we've done banking legislation. You need to talk about, uh, I think, relief, which is a key element and is the most sort of proto-Keynesian bit of the New Deal. But let's set that aside for a second. The first major feature of the New Deal is to try to plan for recovery, 
by putting the government into the mix of managing prices and wages. And this happens in both the industrial and the agricultural sector. Um, like almost everything that's put forward in the New Deal, these uh, managerial efforts are not created for the purpose. They're kind of hanging around uh, leftover policies that were uh, you know, proposed repeatedly over the preceding decade and a half or two decades. So for the farm sector, forever, uh, farmers have been lobbying to get some kind of equivalent of the protective tariff, something that would produce for them the same kind of price supports that the protective tariff produces for manufacturers. Uh, they finally get this uh, in the form of the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, which levies a tax on processing and uses it to limit production to support prices. So that's, that's one thing that the New Deal does to try to promote recovery. Uh, in the industrial sector, uh, it's a bit different, but the mechanism, again, is something that's been hanging about for a long time. It's modeled on the cooperation between government and business during World War I. And what happens is you have a series of boards, cartels, if you like, for each industry, where a representative of the government will sit down with management, a representative of labor, and a representative of consumers, and kind of craft a code for running the industry. And it'll set uh, wages and prices, or set parameters for wages and prices, and also codes for workplace safety, uh, will recognize unions, and so forth. Uh, and this is the National Recovery Administration. How big, how big is that? It, well, roughly, is how many people are in that business? Obviously, its real effect is is not measured by the the physical size of the staff or the budget. But do you have a feel? Do you remember what that number is something like? I, I actually do not. I was gonna. It's not so important. It's okay. Through my book and see if it's I had okay. written it down in there. I mean, the thing about the NRA is okay. Number one, I think almost everybody says the NRA is dreadful. Yeah, it sounds like a horrible idea by yeah. modern economic. Standards. Well, I mean, you, you can start with, in principle, it's a terrible idea, <laughs> because uh, leaving aside the central planning part, they're trying to raise prices and wages at the same time. This is going to get you nowhere in terms of a recovery policy. And even Roosevelt says this at the outset. You know, this is, this is, this is a problem. Um, second of all, though, even if it were perfectly implemented, that would be a problem, but it's imperfectly implemented, as is the case of all the New Deal bureaucracies, because you're trying in a time of emergency to assemble, and I just said I don't know how many, but it's many bureaucrats on sure. the fly it's to do the job. It's a huge logistics and, uh, problem. Yeah, it's a tremendous logistic problem. This, this turns up with the AAA, where they can't get the necessary forms out you know, for cotton subsidies quick enough, and they end up with a cotton crop in the ground that they didn't want, and so forth. The same goes with the NRA. I mean, in theory, you're going to have all these cartel boards, and that might have been you know, one thing if it had evolved over time, but to assemble them on a crash course, what ends up happening is you almost never have a consumer representative. You rarely have a labor representative. You rarely even get a code written in most of these cases. So uh, it's kind of it's just an enormous failure, both in principle and in practice. But it is a it is a part of the psychological. Um, I don't know what you want to call it, the, the ambiance of the era. It is, it is something that is talked about, I assume, and, and <clears throat> waved yeah. about as a, as a success. I think through the fall, and uh, you know, it doesn't really get going until late in the summer of 33, and through the latter part of 33, there's a great deal of hope for it. And uh, in as much as it's uh, modeled on World War I uh, cooperation between government and business, Roosevelt uses a lot of martial metaphors in getting it going. They have a general, Hugh Johnson, running it. They have a, a logo with the Blue Eagle, uh, you know, and they have, uh, you know, businesses are encouraged to display the Blue Eagle to show that they're cooperating and taking part in this. This is kind of, you know, enthusiasm for it initially. This falls apart really, really quickly, though, as almost as soon as it becomes clear that it's not actually doing anything. It's pretty much moribund by the latter part of 34. Uh -huh. And uh, the Supreme Court uh, declares it unconstitutional early in 35. But even before that, the Senate uh, only gives it a sort of limited further life, very much against the administration's wishes. So it looks like it's on the way out anyway. Um, so the NRA, not a success. Uh, and it turns out unconstitutional. The AAA uh, also turns out to be unconstitutional. Is the farm the farm, farm policy? Agriculture, yeah. This is where they're killing um, pigs to right. keep prices high. Right. Very Mentioned the cotton moment. crop that gets plowed up. Yes. Yeah. There's also the the infamous slaughter of the the shoats, right? The pigs because you want to drive up pork prices, and that was that was again owing to logistical errors. You couldn't um, 
uh, get the thing going enough to prevent these crops from being produced, so then you had to destroy them. Uh, the AAA is tremendously popular with farmers, perhaps unsurprisingly, but well, not shocking. With, yeah, not with much of anybody <laughs> else. Yeah, and uh, it, it's declared unconstitutional. It comes back under uh, the guise of soil conservation, uh, and the price supports come back too in a, in a form that turns out to be constitutional. But now it's uh, in, a, in a whole different sort of idea of how to manage agriculture. It's now in terms of you know sustainable production and things like that. So that, that's one aspect of the New Deal, and that's kind of what, what I was talking about at the outset, where certain things just get discarded when they don't work. On the other hand, there are certain bits of the NRA, failure though it was, that do work or are perceived to work and are kept. So, for example, the NRA, for the first time really in American history, finally recognizes that unions are legal. Uh, you know, previously they've been vulnerable to all kinds of antitrust prosecutions. This gets re-established uh, under the National Labor Relations Act, better known as the Wagner Act of 1935, so that's kept. The NRA's idea that there ought to be a consumer voice, you know, is kept. And uh, the New Deal fosters the growth of uh, consumer organizations uh, outside the government, but in order that you can have a kind of check on government policies and on centralized uh, management decisions, you can have a consumer voice. And this, this leads to, I think, the, 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 I forget what number we're up to now, but the, the, the final and most important phase of the New Deal. And I borrow the phrase from John Kenneth Galbraith, um, which is the, the, the kind of the, the, the policies that are adopted under the heading of countervailing power. And the idea is, as with the Wagner Act, is that instead of having the federal government do something, you're going to make sure that some organization of people can strike a bargain for themselves. So you're going to recognize the existence of unions and mandate uh, you know, the legality of collective bargaining so that unions can do deals for prices and wages and working uh, conditions on their own, and the federal government won't set it. So the NRA is out. Central planning is out. We're going to let unions bargain with management take care of it themselves. Same thing goes for a num any a number of other uh, New Deal policies that kind of flourish after 1935, which are designed specifically to get around uh, the uh, uh, Supreme Court's adverse reaction to centralization of power and the failure of NRA. So instead of having um, kind of centralized planning, you're going to enable, let's say, the South to fend for itself by making it an economically prosperous region. So you have the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, bringing electricity to the South. The South will now become modern, and we won't have to plan for the South. It will be able to plan for itself. The same goes for the big public works projects in the West. The same goes for things like Social Security, which gives security to workers, um, gives them some surety against being unemployed, and puts them in a position where they should, again, feel able to bargain for themselves. So much of what lasts out of the New Deal is the idea that the federal government ought to be in the position of enabling people to do stuff for themselves rather than actually doing it for them. Yeah, it's really the birth of the mixed economy. It's obviously not... Um I like the way you phrase it. It's an attempt to try to allow market forces to work with some nudges and pushes and shoves rather than direct control by the government. It's worth pointing out a couple things, though. I think the Social Security, just for listeners who aren't aware of it, Social Security in the 30s was trivial. It became an important social program ultimately, and it's, it, of course, started in, in 1935, but a very, very, very small number of people collected a very, very small amount of money, and it was mostly uh, symbolic. Correct? Yeah. Well, I mean, again, like a lot of this, like a lot of the stuff I've just been talking about in the last few minutes here, it's not important as a recovery policy. It's important as a reform policy. The idea is that you're going to prevent further downturns from being as severe, and I think I think people know that at the time. Well, yeah, and I think. You know, again, as someone who's a little more skeptical of the power of unions to boost uh, standard of living, I think it, it's a very interesting social and cultural phenomenon, the way we look at unions today. Union is, <clears throat> unionization in the private sector, I think, fell has fallen almost monotonically, meaning steadily, from about 1955 to the present. And in 55, uh, I don't remember how high it was, but it, you know, it's down to about uh, – it's under 10 percent of the private sector workforce today. So this, this golden era of unionization lasts about 20 years. Part of it includes the war. And then private forces really make unions less – 
important in the economic in the economy as a whole, um, rather than explicit government attempts to either push them or, or reduce them. Do you agree with that? Uh, so we're talking about the sort of the uh, into the Taft Hartley era here. I mean, uh, you know, the, the Wagner Act is amended by the Taft Hartley. Yeah, I don't know Act. much about. Tell me about Taft Hartley. I've heard uh, of it. Taft Hartley. When was that? This is. Uh, see, now we're we're outside the period I'm dealing with. Yeah, this sorry about the that. Defense. That's okay. <laughs> I think it's forty. I'm going to say forty-eight. I mean, okay. it's we'll just after the war. Um, it rolls back some of the guarantees in the Wagner Act, um, and it makes it easier for companies to have you know sort of things like uh, company unions or uh, to be able to um, limit the power of collective bargaining. And that that, that that's a. Um, that is a, 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 a government action that kind of limits the power of sure. unions a little bit. But it's, you know, I think your broader point is correct that uh, the real forces uh, in sort of decreasing the power of unions are probably the, you know, change in the sectoral mix of the American economy yeah, more than anything else. Away from manufacturing. I mean, I mention it because I think there's a lot of. Possibly also, you know, change in immigration policy. That's true too. Yeah. Um, I, I mention it because I think there's a lot of. I consider romance. Obviously, people on the other side of the argument think it's crucial, but I think there's a lot of romance about the role of unions in uh, changing the, the countervailing power today. And um, for me, unions help the people who are unionized, and they make it harder. By definition, they they try to raise wages higher than they otherwise would be, which is problematic for the people who are trying to find work. So it's an interesting issue, especially in the 30s, this whole tension, which we've we keep referring to it obliquely to we want high wages so that people have a lot of money to spend. But if there are a lot of unemployed people, we want to have low wages so that employers will be encouraged to hire them. And so there's this really unsolvable um, dilemma. And what I think part of the problem is, as a microeconomist, not a macroeconomist, is that people need to look at quantities sometimes and not not prices. Prices send signals, but quantities are what are going to be the, the sign of, of recovery and repair. I'll go you even one better there. I say that part of the problem, too, is that, especially in the 30s, but I think also even more recently, is that, you know, there's wide regional variations in sort of what would be a considered a living wage. And national programs are just not uh, necessarily able to deal with that. An excellent um, point. The WPA uh, is, which we, we haven't covered really. Relief turns out to be important. Can we get that yeah, on the talk record? about that. Uh, you know, the, the WPA, which is not created until 35, Roosevelt is very reluctant to have a federal relief policy. He kind of has to be shown that it's necessary. And it's, it's, it's not until 1935 that you get the Works uh, Progress Administration, as it's originally called, which directly employs people to work uh, for the federal government. Um, the WP, part of the WPA's problem is trying to set a wage. And they end up with a sort of regional schedule of wages to try to respect the idea that there are prevailing wages that are different in different parts of the markets. But it's a very crude way of dividing things up by sort of sector and region. And, uh, you know, so for some people, the WPA is great because the prevailing, it's probably particularly true in the South because it's paying a, great, a higher wage than you would get on the private market. In other places, it's a kind of a poor second because it's, 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 a, it's a lower wage. It's, it's very hard, uh, you know, as we know, with central planning to get these kinds of details right. And they've got budgetary issues, obviously. They're very contrary, I think, also to to the myth. I think we have this myth that Hoover did nothing. We have this other myth that Roosevelt was this great uh, Keynesian uh, deficit spender, but he was very uneasy with that, wasn't he? It's absolutely important to mention that Roosevelt was not uneasy. Yeah, I mean, uh, as I say, he's very reluctant to have relief. This is sort of based on the idea that you shouldn't have a dole in America because we're an individualistic society. Uh, he accepts relief very reluctantly. Then in uh, 1937, he begins cutting back on WPA employees because he sees the economy recovering. And this is one of the things that John Maynard Keynes writes him a very nice letter. He says, you probably shouldn't have done that. Uh, Keynes says this was an error of optimism. But, you know, it's, it's, there's, and there's this downturn that begins in 1937 and extends into 1938. Uh, and it's not until 37, 38 that you begin to have new dealers really starting to think they ought to be Keynesians. And even when they do, and they deliberately run a budget deficit then in 38, it's not nearly as big as it ought to be to have the appropriate Keynesian effect. So they're not Keynesians. Not only not Keynesians, they're not even running a really a progressive 
tax schedule, it bears mentioning. Yeah, that's an important point. Talk about that. Yeah, sometimes people focus on the idea that with the, you know, the so-called Soak the Rich Act of 1935, the, the marginal tax rates go way up. Well, Hoover, but, Hoover had increased them, right? Yeah. As he's leaving office, yeah. he has a huge increase in the highest rate. Of course, it doesn't apply to very many people, I assume. And again, most of us would think this is not a brilliant recovery policy Correct. either. But uh, if you look at the... Um, Composition of the federal revenue uh, in the New Deal, it's about half from excise taxes. Right. You know, it, it, it dwindles over the course of the 30s. It starts off being over half in 33. You know, this is a sales tax, a highly regressive form of taxation. Um, you know, individual income taxes are around 20% of the federal revenue. So it's, it's not, um, there's not a hugely redistributionist program going on here with the tax code during the New You have to wait for the war to get that. And so he puts a bunch of people on on uh, relief. on relief. Yeah. He has them doing stuff. Uh, some of it's quite interesting. Uh, some there's of it, murals. You know, persists. What? There's, yeah, yeah, there's murals being painted and bridges yeah. being built, and some of it's presumably hideous and <laughs> yeah, uh, wiped mean, out. But uh, yeah. um, and we're we're getting close to the end of time, and I, I want to give you a chance to to say something more um, um, overarching about about it, but why don't you finish up in, on this part and say uh, what the Supreme Court does. So the Supreme Court initially tosses out a bunch of stuff. Roosevelt threatens to expand the size of it, the so-called packing of the court, and they do become more accommodationist after that, correct? That's correct. In, in, in broad outline, there's a controversy over whether it's which way the causation runs, but yes. Yeah. So in our remaining time, why don't you give – Juan, why don't you summarize what you think is the ex post? As you say, it didn't spring from the mind of one man, but what would you say is significant about the New Deal for the Great Depression? You, you've made the point, which I think is very relevant and important, about the, the things it set in motion for the next really 50 years, um, if not longer. Uh, you know, Social Security is troubled right now, but it, it may survive, and it certainly is, is with us in a much larger form than it than it started with, as are many of these programs, the FDIC and others. What other significance do you want to uh, talk about of the 30s per se for the, for, the, for the 30s themselves? Do you want to try to give a summary of what you want to uh, – you think the uh, impact was on the economy as a whole or anything like that? Yeah, I'll, I'll say a couple of things I think I hope by way of summary. Um, the thing to remember, I think, about the New Deal in, again, just as we talked about the origins of the Great Depression as being international, the New Deal has to be seen within an international context. Uh, this is an era when you have you know, Soviet communism and European fascism as the solutions to the demise of capitalism in the Great Depression. Uh, and that's what it looks like are the alternatives if you're looking around the world. Uh, you know, Hitler's time in office is almost exactly uh, contemporary with Roosevelt's time in office. And yet, here is Franklin Roosevelt in the United States, um, who is pursuing what, it turns out, is not a socialist agenda, is not a fascist agenda. It's not quite the same kind of capitalism as prevailed before, uh, but it is recognizably capitalism. It is recognizably reconciled with uh, certain ideas about liberty and individualism, sometimes to the detriment of the policies themselves. And it's, uh, it seems to go forward on a recognizably democratic basis. And certainly many people throughout the world feel that way about Roosevelt and the New Deal. So that, that, that the idea that you could reckon with the crisis of the Depression without throwing democracy and capitalism overboard is, is probably the New Deal's signal achievement and legacy for the rest of the world. So that's number one. Uh, number two, boy, as a historian, I would really like to be able to say that and to know it was true without the problem of World War II mucking up our ability to treat this as a historical experiment. Yeah, great point. There's very little you can say about the 30s that doesn't have the specter of the war looming over. That's true even of what I said about uh, you know the effectiveness of monetary policy. Uh, I mean, it seems that monetary policy is quite effective because it draws investment in, but that investment is partly fleeing Hitler. Right. If you don't have Hitler, do you still get that investment? Is it still effective? We don't know. Uh, certainly, you know, once you get the recession of 37, 38, you get a much more Keynesian Roosevelt administration. 
suppose they had gone on to run bigger deficits, would they have been able to uh, cure the depression by following straightforwardly Keynesian policies? Well, we don't know because we, we, we don't get to, see, to run that experiment because they end up preparing for war instead. Uh, you know, the Works Progress Administration becomes a war preparedness administration, and a lot of these things are retasked to prepare for the war effort. And of course, you know, you have recovery to pre-crash employment levels in the first year of the war, but it's not what you would call a private recovery. I mean, much of this is driven by government defense contracting. And it's 12 years later. I mean, it's, yeah. it's I think, you know, I think the, carry on though. Let me, I'll come back to that in a sec. Yeah, Go ahead. So, I mean, what, what, what we can say, and I, you know, you know that there's a controversy about how you measure unemployment during the 30s, but what you can say, no matter which measure you use, things are getting better in the 30s. They haven't gotten better by the end of the 30s. And it's, it's difficult to know what direction the Roosevelt administration would have taken had the war not come along and sent them towards you know, military armaments. And I think you know, the, the challenge for economists, I find it fascinating. You said something earlier, which I think is, is always to be kept in mind, which is when you have one data point, you have to be a little bit careful <laughs> in what you generalize from it. Um, you know, we had Robert Barrow on, on Econ Talk uh, months back where he talked about disasters and he's generally and he said you know when these things come along once or twice a century it's it's tough to generalize obviously and it's inevitably leads to ex post storytelling which um economists and historians both are prone to you know i think that the biggest challenge is what is fascinating to me is is that forget the uh current situation people still care about and talk about and write about what caused the depression what got us out of it? And when I was younger, I think the myth was Roosevelt got us out of it. Now the myth is the war got us out of it. And some people are skeptical about that. But of course, you can't rerun the, the movie, as you say. We don't know how much of it was due to the war. We don't know how much of it was uh, due to the climate of investment and uncertainty or benefits that the New Deal created. I'm uh, I think it's a it's just a fascinating historical episode that uh, one can return to over and over again with with uh, with interest. Uh, any other comments you want to make? I would just say that I think uh, I, I mentioned some of those things in the introduction to the book, and I said you know I hope that the book will provide a useful, very short introduction to many of these controversies. So that was my high class way of saying buy my book. <laughs> well, it's a it's a very nice summary. My guest today has been Eric Rauschway of the University of California, Davis. Thanks for being part of Econ Talk, Eric. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.